All right, we're reading in verse 10, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, titling this the titling this opportunity to do good. We find here in verse 10, and as we have therefore the opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Heavenly Father, tonight we ask for Thy blessings, Thy anointing upon the reading of Thy precious Word. Lord, we pray tonight again that You would speak to us, speak to our hearts. And Lord, help us as we consider this subject here tonight and consider this verse. And Lord, we ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday night we preached a message titled, Weariness. And this evening, we want to look for a few moments at taking the opportunity to do good. The context from verses 1 through 10, we must keep this together. The context is, uh, as we see in verse 1, restoring uh, a fallen brother or sister. And he speaks of the fact that we're to bear one another's burdens in verse 2. This is the law of Christ. He continues speaking about that. He speaks about bearing our own burdens. And then he speaks of communicating in verse 6. Those who are taught communicate with those who are the teachers. Then in verse 7 and 8, uh, we considered the, the sowing and reaping, the law, this principle that's given to us in the Word of God. And of course, last week, Verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we faint if we, we, we reap, rather, if we faint not. So this is actually our seventh message in this particular chapter. So this evening, reading verse 10 again and making a few comments on it and then looking at some verses. In verse 10, he says, as we, and the we here is all Christians, all believers, the church in general, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, we see here in this passage, again, let us, uh, as, as we saw in last week in verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity. Again, speaking of every individual in the church, uh, the Bible says in Acts 20, verse 35, is more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, the apostle is quoting the Lord Jesus in that. The word opportunity here, I think we understand clearly what that means. The word opportunity speaks of, uh, of suitable occasions, when the occasion arises, and it, it will arise often if we'll be alert and pay attention to it and seize the moment. In other words, uh, we find here that God gives us opportunities. He gives us open doors. Now, that's what this is. This is when he talks about opportunity here, he's speaking about divine appointments, which includes the providence of God. He speaks here of open doors. And let me just say this, events and circumstances that come in our life are not really interruptions if we'll pay attention to them. Most of the time, they are arranged by God. We need to be alert as doors open and not look at things as interruptions, but be um, conscious of our circumstance and see that God is in control of them. I'll give you an example. I'm not asking you to turn there, but I want you to listen to this. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, he said, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Now, notice the remaining verse. He said, Well, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. So, we siege upon the opportunities while we are alive. They come a time... We all must die. There come a time when there's no more opportunity to serve. And that's okay. God has arranged that. But what he's saying in our text is look at 
opportunities open doors as divine appointments. In other words, God has arranged this and this fits into his providence. Now, notice he says here in this passage, he says, as we have therefore opportunity. He said, let us uh, do good unto all men. The ideal of doing good, good works, we want to focus on that tonight. Chapter 5 and verse 22, uh, part of the fruit of the Spirit is uh, goodness. We spent a lot of time on that. We, matter of fact, one sermon was centered around goodness and faith. And you can write down 1 Timothy 6.18 uh, when he talks about doing good. The admonition is there. So goodness is the fruit of the Spirit which he ha- which he which the Holy Spirit plants within uh, our hearts. Notice this now. He says in verse 10, and we're going to get into some other passages in just a moment. I just want to comment on some of these words. He said, let us do good, notice, unto all men. All men. Write down 1 John 3, verse 16 through uh, 19. Let us do good unto all men. The story of the, uh, of the Good Samaritan uh, teaches us uh, this truth and shows us that the one in need is our neighbor in which we are to love. You know, the question was asked, who is my neighbor? Well, it's not just the guy or gal next door. It's anyone that the Lord brings into our path that has a need. And again, that's a tremendous story that teaches us about this. So he tells us here, as we have opportunity, let us do good, first of all, to all men. That's saved or lost. All men. But then he focuses in upon the true believer. He says here in verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity to let us do good in all men, that is, we'll just say that is the lost world, all men. And then he says here, especially, especially, in other words, let this be first priority. He said, and especially of them who are the household of faith. I think we know who that is. That, that is talking about the brotherhood as in 1 Peter 2.17. That is talking about the family of God. We see the family of God in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15. And also the church, um, the family of God in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And so there is a clear distinction, I guess, here even in this verse between the saved and the lost. There was, let us do good unto all men as the opportunity rises and especially as we see here in this passage, unto them who are the household of faith. And what I want to do, let me take you through just a few verses, and we're going to turn loose of this passage so that we can go to other places. But let's consider, first of all, God the Father, and that, and we've got an entire sermon on the goodness of God, I believe, which is one of His attributes. But let's look first of all, at the Father, just God, and, and, and what He did. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, let's consider God. We see in the Scripture that God is good. Amen? And He does good. But when we look at the Bible, we see that God is good to the just and the unjust, as I made mention this morning. And so, we are to be followers of God. Uh, God does good to the just and the unjust, even when they don't return the same favor. Okay? And let me give you Matthew 5. We're going to be reading from verse 43 through verse 48. And if you're taking notes, you can write down Luke 6, 33 through 35. And also, one other passage, there's many, I'll just pick out a few to give you. Another one is Acts 14, verses 15 through 17. Again, it shows us the goodness of God, and that God is good to the just and the unjust. Again, as I said this morning, 
we got up and, and enjoyed food and, uh, and sunshine and, and air to breathe and the lost man and our communities got up and enjoyed the same thing. So God is good to the just and the unjust. And so he's telling us to do that. Reading in, in Matthew, from verse 43 to verse 48, this is a, a part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now notice he's going to be speaking here that we're even to do good unto our enemy. He said, But I say unto you, love your enemy. Bless them that curse you, do good. Now there's our expression, doing good. He said, and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despisefully use you and persecute you. Now notice he continues, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, which is in heaven rather, is perfect. So we can learn something from God Himself about doing good, sieging the opportunities when they arise in our life. And so God is good, and He's good to the just, He's good to the unjust, even when there is no favor returned back unto Him. We can learn a lesson there. What about the Lord Jesus? Turn with me to Luke, and notice with me in Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6. Now let me give you two other verses to go along with that. We're going to be reading in verses 6 through 10 in Luke 6. But if you're taking notes, write down Acts chapter 10, verse 38. The Bible tells us here that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. This was his life, his ministry. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So we find the Lord Jesus going about doing good. Good. This was his life. You can also write down Philippians 2. We read this passage several times every year. In Philippians 2, beginning in verse 13, he said, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. So, Jesus went about doing good. He's helping people. He's feeding people. He's healing people. In other words, He's speaking words uh, to them of edification and so forth. You say, what is doing good? Well, basically, it could be a word to someone. It could be a, a deed it could be an act of kindness. It could be helping them. It, I mean, it just includes many things. And uh, he could be even paying a bill for someone, uh, buying a meal for someone. There's thousands of ways that we can do good. And so we're commanded in the Scripture to do so. Now, notice in Luke chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ ministered, and he got criticized for healing on the Sabbath. And I'm reading in Luke chapter 6, from verse 6 to verse 10. It says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an occasion against him. Now we know that that God had told the people to rest on the Sabbath day. They're not to be trying to make money and, uh, you know, and merchandise and things of that nature. But this is a different circumstance here. Uh, they're trying to trap him. And notice what he said. It says in verse 8, But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. 
Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? Looking around about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Of course, they got angry about that. Now, the Lord Jesus wasn't um, trying to make an extra dollar on the Sabbath day. He wasn't involved in the things that were contrary to the law on the Sabbath, but he did good. And it's and 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 he's saying in this passage, he's he's ministering to the needs of others on the Sabbath day. That is not breaking the Sabbath, even under the Mosaic law. He told his enemies, he basically said, it's always good to do good. And we never take a rest from doing good. We take a rest from our activities. We take a rest from uh, working, making a living, things of that nature. But we never rest from doing good, even if it's on the Sabbath. It, it would have been evil to do otherwise when the Lord is uh, has the ability to heal this man. You know, he took that opportunity on the Sabbath. All right. We see in Matthew 5 that the Father, you know, he did good to the just and the unjust. We see that Jesus Christ did the same. Again, Philippians 2, Acts 10. You can include Romans 15 in that because we're going to turn there next. But we find that Jesus went about doing good. Well, notice in Romans 10, I'm sorry, Romans 15, and notice, let's look at the church. Let's consider the church. So we're commanded, as opportunities arise, as God brings circumstances and events into our life, opens doors for us to do good, we find that the Father and the Son went about doing good. Well, notice what the Apostle Paul commends the church for. There's three things. We just read this probably two or three weeks ago. Um, notice in Romans 15, one verse, there's three things that he praises the church at Rome for. And he says in verse 14, Romans 15, 14, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren. Now watch this that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. Three things. No condemnation to the church here. He praises this church because they were full of goodness. Secondly, they were filled with all knowledge. And number three, they were able to admonish one another. They were, they were able to... Re- to stir one another up and instruct one another in the Scripture and in the Spirit. Now, notice the context where this comes from. Back up with me to verse 1. We just read this a few weeks ago also. He says here in verse, beginning in verse 1, now notice what Christ did and what we're commanded to do. He said, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor. See, that's what we're talking about in Galatians 6.10. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope, now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you, be, that you may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So when he writes to the church and commends them and praises them for uh, for the fact of one of the things they're full of goodness, we began this chapter here talking about the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 13. 
So the church at Rome in the first century, to time Paul's writing, they were truly followers of Jesus Christ. They were truly followers. Now notice in Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 15 and 16, and then in verse 20 and 21. He says here in verses 15 and 16, he says, But of him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So he's, he, here in this passage, we, we are, are we are to offer the sacrifice of praise. Now notice verse 16. There's something we're to never forget even when we're offering praise to God with our hearts and minds and with our mouth. Here's something we're not to forget. He said in verse 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. The doing good fits into what we're talking about tonight. Good works, doing good. And to communicate is something we talked about again uh, two weeks ago in, in the Galatians chapter 6. That the word communicate here has to do with giving. But what I want you to notice before we go to verse 20 and 21, I want you to notice here in verse 16 that when we have done good to others, we have offered spiritual sacrifices to God. Think about this. When we have done good to others, we have offered spiritual sacrifices to God. Notice verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That's amazing. That not only... Are we performing good works by the Holy Spirit when we're doing good for others? But we find that God sees this as giving sacrifices unto Him. And He's well pleased with it. Notice verse 20 and 21. He said, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Watch this now. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, we see that God desires to make us perfect, that is, complete, uh, mature, in every good work. And again, this is well-pleasing in the sight of God. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. If you're taking notes, James 4.17 said, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, it is sin. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're just talking, I'm just giving some verses tonight on good, doing good, which has to do with good works. We have, we have an article written probably about 15 years ago or so, um, on good works and subtitled it Glorifying God. And good works or doing good works are found at least 30 times in the New Testament. And uh, in Titus alone, good works is found five times in that small book. And Spurgeon said, in quoting him, he said, the adornment, of good works, the adornment in which we hope to enter heaven is the blood and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But the adornment of a Christian here below is his holiness, his piety, his, his consistency. If some people had a little more piety, they would not require such a showy dress. If they had a little more godliness to set them off, they would have no need whatsoever to be always decorating themselves. The best earrings that a woman can wear are the hearings are the earrings of hearing the word with attention. The best ring that we can have upon our finger is a ring that the father puts upon the finger of the prodigal son when he is brought back. 
The very best dress we can wear, let me start over, and the very best dress we can ever wear is a garment wrought by the Holy Spirit, the garment of a consistent conduct. But it is amazing while many are talking or while many are taking all the trouble they can to array this poor body, they have very few ornaments for the soul. They forgot to dress the soul. And this is his, his thoughts on good works. There's some other quotes here. I'll not get into those. But many good quotes when it comes to the Christian life. We're not talking about getting saved. We're talking about salvation that God has put in our hearts and it being worked out. Verse 75, verses 9 and 10. We have here widows who are qualified to receive support, that is financial support, from the church and they are to be known for their good works, that is doing good. Verse 9 and in verse 10. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. Watch this now. Twice we see the issue of good works in this verse. Verse 10, he said, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. See, if we keep this thing in proper perspective, good works is seen all through the New Testament. Not saved by them. Again, let's turn to a familiar passage, Ephesians 2. We were in this just a few weeks ago also. In Ephesians 2, let us come to verse 10. Now, how many of you can quote verse 8 and 9? And you're witnessing, right? I, I guarantee every one of us here can quote verse 8 and 9. We, I use that a lot in witnessing as well as other verses. But what about verse 10? We're clearly told in verse 8 and 9 that we're not saved by our good works. But we are clearly told in verse 10 that we're saved unto good works. Now notice as I read this passage... And, and, and if you're taking notes tonight, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 15 through 18. I mentioned this recently too. Uh, there is a family in the church at Corinth. They were some of the first to be converted. And they were addicted. It's a holy addiction. They were addicted. You know, we hear so much about addiction today. There was a holy addiction here, and it, they said they were addicted to the ministry of the saints. That is, the household of God. Especially, we are to do good unto the household of faith. So that's a tremendous passage on this subject. But notice in Ephesians 2.10, he says here, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I mentioned to you recently. The Greek word P-O-I-E-M, that's translated workmanship here, is where we get our English word poem. And our English word poem means something composed or something made or constructed. In other words, we're artfully created. He says, verse 10, for we, we are His workmanship. Notice, created. Created. We are the result of a created power of the Almighty God. We not only were created physically, as in the Garden of Eden, uh, God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden. We are, we are created in God's image. But when we become a Christian, we become a new creature, a new creation. We have a divine nature, Second Peter 1, verse 3 and 4. And so, he says here that we're created unto good works. 
We are the result of a created act. And the good works here are the fruit of salvation, the fruit of that created act. So we are created, we've been recreated spiritually, we've been regenerated. But notice this beautiful thing here that we see we are His workmanship. That's how special the saints of God are. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Look with, look with me at Titus. Notice with me in Titus. And I'm reading in chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Now notice here, again, five times in the book of Titus, we have the issue of good works. We see it in chapter 1 and verse 16. We see it again in chapter 2, verse 7 and verse 14. We are a peculiar people to be zealous of good works. Chapter 2, 14. But notice with me as we come to chapter 3 and verse 8. I'm going to read in verse 8 and also in verse 14. As he's closing this letter, he said, This is the faithful saying, And these sayings I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain, it's the next two words, good works. These sayings are good and profitable unto men. Verse 14, And let ours, that is our own people, the saints of God, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Now I've got just a few other passages I want to turn to. I want you to turn with to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. And notice here, I'm going to read in Matthew 26 and make reference to Matthew 25. You may or may not want to write these down, but I give you a few other passages. Now, we just read in Matthew 5 about good works. Uh, if you go to the beginning of that chapter, in verse 14 through 16, good works, they glorify our Father which is in heaven. In 1 Timothy 2.10, professing godliness with good works. Verse Timothy 6.18, that they be rich in good works. 2 Timothy 2.15, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Again, for 2 Timothy 2.2, um, 2, prepared unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3.17, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Thessalonians 2.17, establish you in every good work. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, may abound to every good work. Revelation 14, 12, and 13, our works will follow us into the kingdom of God. Probably in the last 15 to 20 years, every funeral that I preach, most of them I started off in Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. Or that our, our works follow us into the kingdom of God, our good works. And then in James 2, the entire chapter, but especially from verse 17 to the end of the chapter, we find that works are the visible evidence of genuine faith. He says, faith without works is dead. And um, that lines up very perfectly with Romans 4. There's no contradiction between the two. One quote of, uh, of another author, he says, Good works are faith incarnate. And that's what James 2 is all about. Well, notice in Matthew 26, and Matthew chapter 26, and I'm coming down to, coming down to verse, um, let me begin with verse 6. He says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. 
And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, What purpose is this waste? Well, this ointment might have been sold for much, giving and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she has wrought a, what's the next two words? A good work. Now, this is Mary of Bethany. And it says here, She has wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Now, verse 13, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told a memorial of her. Think about this. 2,000 years later, we just read this. In other words, this became a memorial unto her. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still talking about this woman that gave something very valuable and very precious to the Lord Jesus Christ, anointing His body for burial, maybe, maybe she understood something about the Lord going to the cross that the disciples did not even understand. Very spiritually minded woman, and she's willing to give most of what she had for the burial to anoint the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said, this is going to be a memorial. This is to be repeated. And I just wonder sometimes, millions of times, you know that this has been read, millions if not billions of times in 2,000 years that this has been spoken. And is spoken here tonight in 2020. Well, let's look. Let's look at just a, a few other passages. Matthew 25. This refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The text begins about verse 31, the Lord coming, separating the sheep from the goats. And notice as we come here in verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepare, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He said, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came into me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. This is reversed in the following passages with those who end up in hell. I made reference to this passage this morning. You know what chapter 25 here is talking about? It's just simply talking about what Christians do. True Genuine Christians, what do they do? Well, they help the sick. They help those in prison. They help those who need to be clothed. In other words, they're constantly concerned with the needs of others. That's what true, genuine Christians do. They're concerned with the welfare of those that are around them. Let's turn to one other passage, and I'm going to give you two others. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, the other two verses I want to give to you, one is in Jeremiah chapter 4, in Jeremiah chapter 4, and that's going to be in verse 22. The Lord says, for my people is foolish, they have not known me, they're sottish people, they have not under, they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. Now listen to the last statement. But to do good, they have no knowledge. To do good, they have no knowledge. This is a condemnation of His people ready and ripe 
for judgment for the Babylonian captivity. And he mentions several things, but he says, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Another one is in Psalms, in the book of Psalms, 37 verse 3, and it says this, Trust in the Lord and do good. He says, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. There's a promise that comes along with trusting God and doing good. Those kind of go together. Trusting God and doing good. And then there's the promise uh, to Israel here in the Old Testament that you shall dwell in the land and thou shalt be fed. Cannot ever outgive God. Now, let's close in Hebrews chapter 10. And notice here carefully as we come to this. He says here, now, there's three... If you were to pick up the reading from verse 19... And maybe we'll do this. Let's read from verse 19. There's three times in our text he said, let us do something. And notice he begins in verse 19. He said, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, here's the first, let us draw near with a true heart. We're to draw near unto the Lord based upon verses 10 through about verse 18 where we find that Jesus has sanctified us and perfected us forever who belong to Him. And He's speaking of the new covenant in verses 16 and 17 and 18 which brings forgiveness, and remission of sins. So, we are, verse 22, he said, let us draw near with a true heart. We're to draw near unto the Lord. The next time he says in verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. There's the second. Let us. Let us do something. I got a sermon. I can't even tell the title and what year it was, but I took these three thoughts. Let us. And there's, there's three texts here. But I'm after verse 24 and 25. Now notice this. He says here in verse 24 and 25, here's another, let us. He said, and let us consider one another. Well, how in the world can I consider other believers, the household of faith? There's many ways, but here's one. He said, let us consider one another. Notice to provoke. Now, this means to stir up or to arouse, not in a bad way, but a good way. You can provoke somebody in a bad way, but this is a good way. He said, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Here's that good works again. And he says, verse 25, not forsaking the assembly. He's talking about public worship as we are here tonight. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you know that that uh, not only before I started preaching, but even now, but ten years before I started preaching, I was always encouraged to come into God's assembly and hear the Word. But I was very much encouraged, I'm going to say probably equally encouraged, to come and to be with the saints. I was provoked to love and good works as I would assemble the saints, and I still am to this day. We come together to worship, to sing, to give testimony, to pray as a, as a unit, as a congregation. But there's much more that goes into this. We come to, you know, for the teaching of God's Word. But he says here, let us consider one another. Now think about this. Consider others. Consider others. Let us consider one another to provoke and uh, to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I am encouraged when I see the saints of God come into the assembly. Unto this day, before I began preaching, this is not just a preacher thing, but I'm was encouraged then, I am encouraged today to see others 
faithful and loving to come to public worship. And so, when we assemble together, we are stirring each other up. We're considering each other. We're provoking one another unto love and to good works. Let us always remember that. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day that You've given us. We thank You for Your love, Your kindness, Your mercy to us. We thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for, again, the opportunity to assemble together. We pray tonight, now Lord, that Thy will just be done in our lives. Bless this upcoming week and all of the activities that we will be involved in. We pray, Lord, that we would Seize the opportunities to do good unto all men, and especially of those of the household of faith. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.